Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Healing Connections podcast. I'm your host, Emmy Badness, and today we are talking about living in a wild country. Is a community based on love possible with Niren, who has been a lawyer for 40 years, a daily meditator for over 30 years, a mediator and a coach for over 20 years, and from being a big firm lawyer, he has come to a very quiet life in nature, meditating, writing, and doing his work as a consciousness coach. He may be currently best known for being Osho's lawyer and was featured in the Emmy award-winning documentary, Wild Wild Country on Netflix. Welcome, Niran. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you. Nice. To, it was really, I, I really enjoyed connecting with you for a couple of minutes before we started. It makes me, uh, you know, it, it feels good. So I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you. I appreciate that too. And that's why I wanted to talk with you is I, felt a, a connection with you and that when, you know, there's many things I want to talk with you about, but just to kind of get started, how I came to know you is through, you know, maybe a lot of people watching Wild Wild Country. And I really felt that your voice, your presence, your energy was very balanced and, and measured. And um, for those who haven't seen the documentary, I highly encourage you to watch it. Now, I know that you also travel around the country and give talks about what you feel wasn't maybe fully described in that documentary. So there might be some, uh, this is a, you know, for those who haven't seen it, definitely check it out, but we are going to be getting into that and other things that you do. And um, so just a heads up on that. So could you share a little bit about how you've come from being an attorney to a consciousness coach? Wow, that's a long, I mean, that's a short question, but a long period of time. You know, it's sort of funny. I, I, I can sort of start with what, what you were just talking about that I've seen measured and centered or however you described it. My nickname when I was a trial lawyer in Los Angeles in a big firm was Mad Dog. I was incredibly aggressive which in, the practice, in that practice of law paid off, in my personal life, not so much. Mm. And I burned out, you know. I, I was uh, in the fastest growing law firm in the United States. I was making as much money as anybody my age doing what I was doing was making. I had my house in Brentwood and my Mercedes, blah, blah. And then my marriage, my, my marriage ended, I, a, a wife with two kids, and that's a whole different story. But what then was, I'm driving into, I'm driving in from my house in Brentwood to Century City every day, and I was raised a Catholic, so I was kind of a, a family was a real, real important thing, you know. And I thought, what? In am I doing? Mm. And for over a lot of things, you know, drug, sex, and rock and roll, I uh, was really had everything I always thought I wanted, and I was from time to time suicidal. So I decided to take some time off, got rolled into something else. A few months later, I ended up in Pune, India. I was looking for inner peace. That's what always what I was looking for from the beginning was, you know, I was just had so much tension in me, so much stress, so much dissatisfaction, anger, fear. I ended up, through a connection of friends and this and that, I ended up in Pune. Three days later, I was a disciple of Osho. And that's been my, that's really been the focus of my life ever since. I've been, I practice law off and on ever since. I'm also a certified hypnotherapist and NLP practitioner. And I've taught meditation, blah, blah, blah. But that's been my main professional focus for most of those years. 
I was OSHA's personal lawyer, dealt with a lot of cases for him. But in terms of how I got from there to here, the centeredness or space or relaxation or presence you experience was a gift from existence through OSHA. And from the first moment I walked into his commune in India, ashram in, in India, I just was blown away by the atmosphere of love and acceptance and transformation. Where and that's really been my path ever since with some, you know, it's like the, the Taoists talk about a river being the river, being like water and flow. Sometimes it's rocky, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's a little stagnant depending on what the flow is doing. Mm -hmm. And depending on how we're interfering with the flow with our minds, which is what we do. So I had some marriages work and for that whole time I've been doing like an ongoing investigation pulling together documentation about what happened how the United States government screwed us I mean it's very simple you know on some levels if the United States government decides to get you and you're a spiritual religious minority led by a little brown guy um, and you're, he spoke so strongly against the hypocrisy of most organized religion. And politicians really slammed politicians for their hypocrisy and corruption. Those politicians aren't going to like him. Those religious leaders aren't going to like him. So they're going to do what they can do to get rid of him. And that's what they did in Oregon. Wild Country got some of the story, but some of it they didn't get. But to get back to where you're at, that path that you asked, it's been, you know, it's a funny thing in a way. It's, it's everybody's path. Osho said, there's many paths up the mountain, but there's only one mountain. The mountain is consciousness, awareness. Osho said at the highest level, awareness and love are the same things. Not our emotions, not our desire, not our instinctual drives, not our needs, not our attractions. Love itself, which is an energy. And at the highest level, at the higher levels, love becomes compassion. Compassion arises out of awareness. Awareness arises out of compassion. So that's the mountain. That's what the, the you know, that's where, that's, and, and my path has been Osho. Um, I mean, <laughs> I've also sat with a lot of other people, you know, I've been with, a, lot, a number of my friends are renowned therapists and teachers. In the Osho tradition. And I respect that there are many paths. I mean, there's some people teaching right now who I, I, I feel are just fantastic, you know. A guy named Muji is a wonderful teacher, an enlightened guy. Um, Eckhart Tolle is lovely. A lot of, there's a number of people. I can't remember. A woman, what's her name? Um, she's in the, tra in the tradition of uh, Gangaji. Mm. Beautiful woman. She and I used to have the same dentist. I'd come <laughs> sit and chat. Or, or not dentist. Um, chiropractor. Mm. Um, lovely, lovely, energetic. But my guy's Osho, you know, mm -hmm. always has been, always will be. When I close, he, he said before he died, he said, I will be more with you when I'm gone 
that I'm able to be now because my body was all of its pain and limitation. So whenever you whenever you look for me in your heart, I will be there. And that has been true for me. So that's how I got here. Thank you. That's a beautiful description. And even through your energy and body language, it seems like you told a story just now, um, even describing what your nickname was and how that awareness and what your sounds like your can you dry, describe a little bit about what consciousness coaching is then i would imagine it sounds like maybe you're helping people up that mountain of what you just described is that what you say would say it is or yeah yeah that's right basically uh, one of the oldest known meditations is vipassana right or insight meditation as it's called here in the united states buddha channeled it. Uh, there's a couple of places in the United States that are most famous. A guy named Jack Cornfield, a place called Spirit Rock is a place that's really based on that sort of work, it's although they all do other stuff as well. But Vipassana is simply, you know what Vipassana is. Yes, you, absolutely. You, you close your eyes and you watch your breath. It means clear seeing is my understanding. Well, it may mean that, but the practice is you close your eyes, you watch your breath. Mm -hmm. thoughts come you just as much as you can just notice the thoughts bring your attention back to your breath mm -hmm. be aware of the breath I have de developed a couple of practices one uh, that is the, the main one is really based on Vipassana um, but it's a, a way those practices are ways to throughout the day you know, because many people, we meditate, right? We meditate. Then we get up and we go out, and if somebody cuts us off, we're screaming and waving our arms, you know? It's like it becomes a, a place we go, but it doesn't really f come to the rest of our lives. That's true for a lot of people. Although for, it's also true for many people. And it does change you. You know, it has, over the years, I'm certainly not mad dog anymore. Uh, but the practice is about using the fundamentals similar to Vipassana. I mean, the same, pra same things you do in Vipassana with some things added so that people actually using the practices come back to awareness again and again through the day. These practices, techniques allow you to come back to awareness, come back to the breath, disidentify from the egoic mind and emotions, come back and be, be centered, be, come to relaxation. And by doing it as a practice over time, two big things happen. One is we reduce our identification with the mind. We become more, more observant just to what the mind is. You know, it's like this radio you can't turn off. And we also, at the same time, develop more of a relationship with the present moment, more of a connection to the present moment. That's one of the primary, that is the primary practice I teach, but then off of that are several heart meditations I teach to develop heart awareness and connection. There's a practice I teach that is uh, based on an NLP, working with parts practice, but on a deeper and more spiritual level, to make contact with our, the parts that are in pain, the parts that are hurt and wounded, and to bring awareness to those parts and compassion to those parts, to allow self-acceptance and integration to occur. Um, so I do stuff. I don't I mean, sometimes when I'm talking to people like you, I talk about Osho, I talk about, I did something called Conscious, conscious Conversations with Narendra and Raj on Facebook for a while, just answering questions about 
spirituality and how things work and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I'm fine to do that. Some people seem to find that helpful. Some are fine to do it some, but basically what I'm really after is people going inside, people doing the work, people transforming themselves to become more aware, more loving, more compassionate human beings toward themselves and others. Mm -hmm. To answer your question? Yes, yes, it's beautiful. And we definitely need more of that in our society. Um, I could ask about going about 10 different directions right now. I just want to just offer a little bit when you were talking about Vipassana and the, you know, the common kind of, for better, for better, I would like to think, uh, pop psychology, popular in the true sense of the word pipe psych, pop psychology, mindfulness has become a coined term by John Kabat-Zinn, as I'm sure you know, and those who are listening. Um, but really, my understanding is that that does come from Vipassana meditation and something that, that I know that I've struggled with in my own practice is that, uh, and everybody's going to come to it how they're going to come to it, but the way you're describing it sounds like the depth people need to go to. And in my experience, not everyone... Um, is ready or wants to go to that level. So it's, it's lovely that you're teaching it. And I also think you being a male, having a background in law, being an attorney, um, I know you're also a professional mediator, which is near and dear to my heart. My mother now retired is uh, also practiced as a professional mediator. And um, so I just think it's wonderful what you're doing. And I'm just curious, since we're on the topic of some of these healing modalities, and then I would like to ask you a few questions about Osho. Um, let, let me, before you go on, let me respond to a couple of things you just said. You're talking about John Kabat-Zinn. He's a wonderful meditation teacher. I actually, you know, he comes out of Spirit Rock. I mean, he used to be involved with all these guys. Uh, mindfulness itself, what, what, what he's teaching, what Jack Cornfield is teaching, what the guys on the East Coast are teaching, what everybody's teaching is what Buddha was teaching. You know, it's all about awareness. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness, mindfulness, I mean, the traditional, Osho wouldn't have liked that term or didn't use that term much because mindfulness, it's like mindful. Versus Mindful up. means thinking. Yeah. Ego. Yeah. Up in the head. Mm -hmm. Right. But at least on one level, it can mean that. So it's sort of confusing. Mm -hmm. Awareness or consciousness. But again, all of these things are, you know, like Lao Tzu said, the Tao, which is the true Tao, cannot be said. Exactly. You know, so the, terms. Yeah. the words don't get there. And like Osho said, he said, don't bite my finger, look at where I'm pointing. They're all just indicating. They're indicating. Yeah. And so if people, if people understand mindfulness, it's just, but it's the same thing that they've been, mm -hmm. they've been, been there since long before Buddha in terms of teachings, you know. Mm -hmm. Go back to the Bhagavad Gita, you know. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it gets turned into ritual, but on its, at its base, it's about deepening awareness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Deepening awareness. Yeah, and what struck me from watching the documentary is the intention of Osho and everybody in the community, and I know the community is still thriving on many continents, that what I have been observing happening is that things like meditation, yoga, you know, all these types of practices, people developing, you know, mindfulness, however it's termed, does seem to be growing. And would, are you at all pleased with seeing that and thinking that maybe his intention and others who have been behind wanting to bring, you know, human consciousness forward, that that has been growing and expanding? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no question about it. It's, uh, you know, Osho didn't think in terms of 10 years or 50 years. He thought in terms of hundreds of years. Mm. And thought is the wrong word. He had a consciousness. It was vast, an awareness that was vast. 
So what he was doing was trying to swing the biggest Zen stick he could swing, plant as many seeds as he could plant, it's a different approach, for example, than Buddha took. Buddha, it was a different time, right? Buddha had a lot of people who came to him and then passed on through him, passed on his work. But with Osho, we were like at the we were in the electronic age, and he could reach a lot of people. His 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 discourses, he talked every day for years, you know, very beautifully and everything. And his talks were transcribed. And those became his books. Those are all still available. The videos, when, you, when there was videos available, all the books are available through the website, osho.com. And it continues to unfold. Like you said, there are many paths up the mountain. You know, there are many teachers now, many group, wonderful teachers now, a few beautifully enlightened teachers now, maybe more than a few. But Osho also said that light and darkness are always in are always seeking balance. Everything in existence is always seeking balance in its own way, except the human mind. <laughs> <laughs> the human mind is the only thing in existence in existence that is not seeking some sort of balance and living in some sort of balance. Mm. Mm -hmm. Any animal you could name is somehow part of a bigger system that they are living in balance with, whether you're whether you whether you are the uh, antelope or the lion. Mm -hmm. Except for the human mind. And that that's where all that darkness is happening. Our collective. I mean, you don't have to be a lot into politics to realize to see. There's, I mean, it's like we're now supposed to be, they call it a post-truth society. Mm. Think about that. A post-truth society. And it's really true in a way. You look at what that guy in Washington is doing and what his people are doing, totally disregarding what actually happened, telling their story, and people buy it because it fits their bias, it fits their need, it fits their fear. And they are very largely speaking to fear. So light and darkness are seeking balance, seeking harmony. Mm -hmm. So he, he said in times of great darkness, there will be great light. Mm -hmm. And it's my sense that that's the case, you know, mm -hmm. because in the face of this darkness, if you just look at it, you know, look at, like I was, I was looking, at, I'm looking at the New York Times, and, and there was an article yesterday about uh, just the demographics of young people and how they're voting, mm. how active they're becoming. Every few generations, there's a big shift. You know, back in the 60s, I came to adulthood in the 60s, which I still, well, I think it's a conclusive argument that it was the best time ever in the history of man to be born and live on the planet. And I grew up in- I'm in jealous, my, I'll admit it. <laughs> in my young adult years were in San Francisco. So what more could you ask for in the 60s? So, but they want, they're, they're reacting to this hypocrisy, you know, mm. as we were back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But it's alive again and it's really going to be interesting to see, you know, the, the Democrats are going to a much more progressive stance than they have in the past years, you know. Clinton and even Obama were more moderate, which is fine. Uh, they, you, you need to be realistic to get things done. But this whole universal health care, mm -hmm. Medicare for all thing, just the numbers on it, the statistics on it, how much fear it engenders in older people. It's just amazing when you look at the numbers, hmm. how much hostility gets raised. Hmm. We are in our society coming to a point of confrontation of ways of living, ways of seeing. 
and it really sort of comes down to, again, the shift from the head to the heart. All of the fear and the greed and the ambition and the desire, the no such thing as enough money, you know, no such thing as enough money for some of these rich people. To people who have very little. Mm-hmm. But then on the people who, compassion means, from the Latin derivative, to feel with. Compassion means feel, calm means with. So it means to feel with, it means relate to, it means to feel people to feel something outside yourself on a broader and broader level. The more compassion you have, the more the compassion can encompass. And we are actually, as I see it, in a crisis. We go from, everything goes from equilibrium to disequilibrium, equilibrium to disequilibrium. We're in a period of profound disequilibrium And the real question is, will our species truly survive on this planet? Mm -hmm. And can our species find a way to move from the mind to the heart, to move from greed to compassion, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from fear to love? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of light happening where people are choosing love, Mm -hmm. needing love, seeking love. Not the happily ever after kind of thing, although every, a lot of people still want that. Mm-hmm. But the love that involves getting we're all in this together, you know? Hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was a comic strip years ago, one of my favorites from many years, called Pogo Possum, written by Walt Kelly. You ever hear of it? I have. I have. Pogo was a philosopher of sorts uh, from the swamp. And he would say from time to time in the, when, he was, when they were looking at the political things of the day, we have met the enemy and he is us. Mm-hmm. To really get that we're the good guys and the bad guys, it's all us, you know. We can't find a way to be us. Now, you can't expect the egoic mind to say, oh, that's a fine idea. (laughs) That's not that's not the the way of the egoic mind. There has to be a mass collective of compassion and understanding and commitment to our species and our plan that gets big enough and powerful enough that outweighs that. And then through education and meditation over time. You know, Osho talked about light and darkness a lot. And he said, you don't have to fight the darkness. Mm. You just have to turn on the light. He said, when you go into the room, you don't push the darkness out of the way. Mm -hmm. You just turn on the light and the darkness is gone. Mm -hmm. Awareness is light. Fear is darkness. The more we allow the light within us to expand. There was an old folk song many years ago that I used to sing when I was in the folk singing tree. Let my little light shine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we all need to do. Let our little lights shine. Yeah. Oh. Set the world on fire mm. with love. Absolutely. Thank you for that. It's beautiful listening to you. And I'd like to ask you a little bit about Osho, because I know you know him, knew him, know him quite personally. Before we get to that, can you share? Because a lot of people are striving to climb a different mountain of what they think might be success of, and not that all of this is necessarily quote bad, but where they're maybe trying to climb a materialistic mountain, um, wanting to have a lot of things or money or be more powerful than others. And could you share 
a little bit about what that was like for you, because it sounds like by a lot of Western culture standards, you were very successful. Um, as an attorney in LA, my understanding is you represented various celebrities, um, were doing quite well financially, but it sounds like at some point something was missing for you. So um, can you share what happened for you that made you want to seek something else? Sure. Everybody, everybody who, who commits themselves to get as much as they can, all discover that it's empty and meaningless. The thing is, though, is that for some people, the mind is so powerful, the fear is so great, the greed is so strong because of their fears, but they never let themselves, they can't look at that. So they just keep going for more and more and more and more and more. Maybe on their deathbed they see something. Maybe some later in their life they see something. A lot of people, for example, the people around Osho, we had more college degrees on the ranch than we had people. A lot of graduate degrees, a lot of therapists, a lot of doctors, dentists, lots of professional people, engineers, uh, and lots of work, you know, and people from all walks of life, massage therapists. Uh, mechanics, everything you could imagine. What they had in common, most of them, is that they had had success in the world mm -hmm. and found it unsatisfying on some deep level. Interesting. They had success, but it didn't make them happy. It didn't bring them inner peace. So they were adventurous enough as human beings and or in enough pain. I've often said that the best motivator we have to get to seek transformation is pain. Because we're in such pain, this species is in such pain and so tough. And me meditation actually offers a refuge, a respite from that pain, ultimately, ultimately transforming fully into love and awareness. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I often get into this part of it with people. It doesn't mean that you're going to get enlightened by meditating. Osho said enlightenment is an accident, <laughs> but meditation makes you accident prone. <laughs> it's one of those things where you can't do it. You can't make it happen. But you also don't get there without an incredible intensity of search for most people. For some people, it just, you know, knocks them off the chair, like mm -hmm. Mr. Tony. Mm -hmm. So, but we all have that yearning for peace. We have that yearning to relax, the yearning for love and oneness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is what. So you can have all the money in the world, you can have this and that, you can have professional success, this and that. Now, some people go at it in different ways. You know, some people don't necessarily go into a formal meditation or that isn't their path. Some people just find their way through life. They have a, an avenue of creativity and that works for them. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's only through transformation of consciousness that this species, a deer in my front yard. Hmm. I have a fruit orchard in my front yard. And uh, when it starts to get cold, the deer come down from the mountains here. And there's one family that thinks this is their winter home. <laughs> Beautiful. How anyway. symbolic. Could you share a little bit about Osho? Um, and my understanding is you were, at the end of the documentary, it said you were writing a book. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually, it's gonna end up being two books. 
Uh, one that I'm almost finished with is a basically legal political analysis in great detail about exactly what happened legally and politically. Hmm. Uh, fully supported by documentation, legal analysis, all that stuff. That's almost done. And I'm also working on a book that is basically sort of memoirish about my time and the times beyond the just the story of what took place legally and politically. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on both of those. I'm my intention is to be finished. Well, I'm going to be. Fi I'm hoping to be finished with the not hope. My intention is to be finished with the legal political part um, in the next three or four months. Mm -hmm. The other part will take a, a maybe another six months or more because. But if that's easy. That's just telling stories. You know, I'm good at telling stories. Mm -hmm. The legal political is getting harder and harder for this old brain to pull together. <laughs> well, and it was so, um, seems like it was so intense and <laughs> that experience, you know, not to mention all the other legal cases I'm sure you've handled. So that's a good insight in the sense that it would be losing the community having the community destroyed by the United States government. And then the other biggest thing is when Osho died, that was so hard for me. Uh, you know, so they said that they, sannyasins are supposed to celebrate everything, celebrate life, celebrate death, celebrate everything. Mm. I was there when he died and it was hard for me to celebrate that. I just was not ready for him to go. I, it took me years to get over it. But I also get that that's, I think, why he did it, so that we would be thrown back on ourselves, you know? Because mm. a lot of us would have been happy just to sit with him as much as we could for as long as we lived, you know? Absolutely. And could you give us a little insight into what it was like to be with him and why he had and continues to have, and my understanding is even a growing following? Well, I mean, it's pretty simple. We sort of, first, let me talk about what I'm about an enlightened master is, okay? And this is my own view. It isn't necessarily a traditional teaching, although it isn't inconsistent with what Osho or anybody else said, but I, I sort of mo model it in a different way. I like to get as simple as I can with them. I find that helpful. Osho was incredibly articulate. He talked forever about things and said one thing the one day and the opposite thing the other day because there are paradoxes in this whole dance right mm -hmm. if you don't get the existence of osho said if you don't get the existence if you don't come become comfortable with paradox and understand that seeming opposites are complementaries you can't very move very far in spiritual transformation mm -hmm. enlightenment is well a, de a, de a definition is the permanent disidentification from the mind and ego. Mm. Disidentification means, I mean, we're all totally identified with our egos, right? Like this, egos, emotions, we're there with it. it we're inside of all of that. Okay? And if you could also just briefly share what ego is for those who are maybe new to these concepts. Uh, the mind has several levels of function. I'll talk about a couple of them just to simplify it. There's the cognitive function where two plus two equals four, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's the memory function, which goes with cognitive. I got to get up and go to work. It's eight o'clock. I got a job. And then there's the whole thing underneath that, which a lot of people call conscious and unconscious. Within that also at the conscious level and then rooted in the unconscious level of emotions. Osho said, also one of my other favorite guys is Ramana Maharshi, an amazing, amazing teacher. I spent some time at his place in Tiro of Animal Life. He's, you know, he died in the 50s, so it's a long time ago, but he was a powerful, powerful mystic. Uh, he said, there's no such thing as the mind. There's only these thoughts. Osho said, the mind is completely made up of fear. And the way I see it energetically is we have these fearful thoughts 
we develop a strategy to deal with them. We develop a structure all around that that we call our personality. And that becomes concretized. It's like black stuff, held energy, stopped energy, repressed energy. Because on a conscious level, we don't want the fear, so we push it down. We don't want the fear, so we push it down. It all goes into the unconscious and becomes actually more powerful. We push it down, push it down. So then what happens? We get, boom, something happens and the anger comes out. Rage comes out. Fear comes out. And if we don't come, if we don't come to grips with that, if we don't find a way to accept and open ourselves to more of ourselves, to our shadow, if you will, then there's no way out. It's just there always. We're in repression and repression actually makes it stronger. Because we're pushing it down like a spring. You push it down, it comes back. You push it down. That which we resist persists. Hey, there you go. True enough. Uh, all of that stuff is happening all the time. And when we're completely identified, we have awareness. We have awareness. But our awareness is almost completely focused on our ego and our emotions and on our body. We're identified with the ego and the emotions and the body. We think we're the, we think that's what we are. We think that's what we are. So we don't even, many, many people don't even get that there's such a thing as their awareness mm -hmm. because they see it as a part of this machine. But in fact, it's a very different thing. It's not part of the machine, but it has through conditioning gone in to be just in service to the machine, the ego mind. Mm -hmm. Awareness, meditation, gives us perspective. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we create some disidentification mm -hmm. from that egoic mind and the body. Enlightenment is when the disidentification becomes total and permanent. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have moments, they call them satori's, you know, or yeah. moments. I mean, sometimes a lot of, you know, it's like you maybe, it used to happen for me when I'd be backpacking on the top of the mountain, I'd look out, and then all of a sudden, it, it just my mind was silent. Everything was silent. I was part of this vastness. Mm -hmm. So we can get little glimpses. Some people get little glimpses in sex. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Love and awareness. A moment. Mostly it's physical or emotional, but there's also moments of just loving awareness, you know, mm -hmm. that happen. So being enlightened is having a permanent disidentification, which means then that you are living on a totally different energetic level. This thing we're carrying, this thing where everything's repressed and this and that, when you become enlightened, you're no longer identified with any of that and the energy just moves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The energy can flow through you. You truly become a channel. But a channel is no longer polluted and affected by all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Not controlled or contained or defined by this stuff. It's just consciousness, awareness. And that, when that permanent disidentification happens and that energy is just flowing, it creates a totally different energy experience for the one embodying it and for people around them. They can feel that energy. Mm -hmm. You know, people have that experience. A lot of people had that being around Osho. Mm -hmm. Well, and I feel, it, I feel it around you right now as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it can happen even imperfectly if you're not enlightened. <laughs> as you as you open up more and more and more and more energy can, energy can happen as and as Osho Osho planted something in me, mm -hmm. and it's had about forty some years to grow as much as I've been allowing it to grow or support it or uh, just <laughs> does its own thing in its own way. Mm -hmm. But in that enlightenment, then many many different things can happen. And even once you go, enlightenment is a threshold in the same way that puberty is a threshold. But that threshold, once you move beyond it, for one thing, you don't come back to the body. 
Osho talked about that. You're not reincarnated if you've been enlightened. Some people are very close to enlightened, and in the next life they become enlightened. But once you're enlightened, in a lifetime, you don't come back to the body. Mm -hmm. That's what he said anyway. I'm, I'm, that's beyond my pay grade. But <laughs> within enlightened people, there's all sorts of different kinds of enlightened people. Some people are enlightened people and just maybe mowing your lawn, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. They have no... They have no desire and may have no talent for talking about it. Mm -hmm. They might be able to really articulate it in any way, in any sort of involved way, you know? Mm -hmm. They may not talk about it at all. Some people also talk. Of those who talk, there are different levels of talent and capability and genius. Osho was incredibly profound. He, his body of work is beyond anything anybody else has ever generated. Uh, when you were in front of him, and, and he was also so beautiful, you know, he was such a beautiful man and so graceful. His movements were so natural and unhurried. The energy flowed through him more powerfully. When you sat with him, whether you were right in front of him or there were 5,000 people, if you were open to him at the end of his, at the end of his talk, everybody was sort of stoned, you know? It was definitely an altered state. You were you were in that space. Now, and then we were all what I used to think of. <laughs> we were all like colanders, you know, <laughs> energetic colanders. The energy would just leak out. And then we'd go back the next day and get filled up again. And the energy would just leak out. But some of it stuck or some of it planted something. But for him, it was just never ending. It was just this never ending flow of energy and light. Mm -hmm. And when he spoke, he would, he never planned what he would speak about. Sometimes there were questions, sometimes there were. He would discourse about a particular teacher, a mystic Jesus or Buddha or Lao Tzu. But it would just come from him, you know? There'd be pauses. So just coming back to and finishing up this description on the energetic part. One time he was, he said, you know, somebody asked him a question about something he was saying or something. And he said, <laughs> He said, if you could just sit with me, I wouldn't talk at all. If you could just sit with me, I wouldn't talk at all. But you can't sit still. So I talk and I tell you stories and I tell jokes. He said, but what's most important is the silence between the words. Listen for the silence. That's beautiful. Everything that is fundamental is learned in silence, you know, in this, in this game. Mm -hmm. Because the reality of this is beyond the physical. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's another part of the thing about awareness. That vast awareness has the big silence in it. Mm -hmm. it that's a quality of it. Mm -hmm. Everything that happens, everything is phenomenological happens between the vastness of energy and the vastness of awareness. Right, and not everybody is um, aware that they're aware that they're feeling that <laughs> or allowing themselves to, to be with it. Well, exactly. It's, we, we, it's a question of where we're putting our attention, where we're putting our awareness. We actually, our, our awareness there's two kinds of awareness, there's guys, but there's this vast awareness. And then there's our little window into awareness. And they're both the same, but our window in awareness is as much awareness as we have capacity for and willingness for at that moment of the vast awareness that's out there. Mm -hmm. 
most people aren't aware of their own awareness. They're aware, in some sense they are, but they just think it's part of their mind, think it's part of this and that, the other thing. They have no sense of it as a separate element. That's why mindfulness, as Zim or Cordfield would talk about, a lot of people in that American uh, Vipassana insight meditation crowd. Awareness is mindfulness, is presence, mm -hmm. right. is right. love, is compassion. Now, to some extent, though, compassion, thing, it has attributes. Like that awareness has silence. Mm -hmm. Silence is a quality of that awareness. So do you think that a community based on love is possible in our society? Hmm. Possible, but not easy hmm. and not likely. Hmm. The thing is, is that as long as we're unenlightened, no matter how good our intentions, greed and ambition and stuff like that happens. Osho talked about it. One of the things that, Anybody who's interested in creating something like that needs to be extremely mindful and remain aware that the most dangerous power, the, the most dangerous, not in a worldly way, but the most dangerous ego for one's transformation is a spiritual ego. Mm. Mm. I'm holy. I'm real spiritual. Because you still have, as long as there's ego, there's still greed, there's still ambition, there's still desire. But when people have to just think, I'm holy, then they act holy. Right, they have an attachment to being a certain way versus maybe being mm -hmm. it. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And then what happens? Then what happens when you repress that dark side? It's when you have, like it was recently in an article, see it quite often, you know, uh, powerful spiritual teachers who then get busted yeah. for sexual abuse of some sort, or abuse of their power in a sexual context. Yeah. Um, that's why spiritual ego is so dangerous, because it leaves you those dark corners. Yeah. If you, can, if you can just get as much as you can come back to it, it's like Popeye. I am what I am what I am. Yeah. If you can just, and like Ram Dass said, honor your present incarnation. Honor your present incarnation. Be who you are this life. Hmm. Bring light to that. Accept that. And then powerful transformation can happen. Yeah. But it can only happen through acceptance and awareness, not through resistance. And acceptance of the self, which is sort of a paradox in a way that some might think might be a paradox, acceptance of the parts that we deem unacceptable. Not that it's okay to act out on them or harm others, but those parts of us that need love. That acceptance need that of light. all parts. Yeah. Except of, I mean, it's, it's easy to accept the light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm loving, I'm beautiful, and this far out. It's not hard to accept. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that motherfucker. Mm -hmm. That's a little harder to accept. Mm -hmm. if you're trying to be a good person. Mm -hmm. But it all has to be accepted. Like you say, not necessarily, not acted on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the darkness, mm -hmm. but understood and then embraced, accepted, mm -hmm. loved. Because those are the parts of us that need to be more perhaps fulfilled with that presence or love, would you say? Sure. Yeah, it's all light, bringing light to darkness. It's as simple as bringing light to darkness. It's always bringing light to darkness, mm -hmm. including compassion, love. Why do you think people in Oregon or the U.S. was so afraid of Osho? Easy. I mean, he was known as the sex guru. He did, again, it's lightness and darkness. He talked about accepting all of ourselves. It's, our, our country, you know, the Christian back then up there, and probably a lot today up 
that was a down from where I am because I'm emotional, but we fear sexuality. We fear people who express their sexuality. We desire it in darkness, but there's still a tremendous amount of fear and taboo about it, which is why from Trump to your neighborhood gas station, people are chasing around doing stuff, you know? When Osho, they called him the sixth guru. He was, a, he was a funny guy. He said, you know, I've written 300 books on meditation and 200 books on sex, and they call me the sixth guru. Hmm. What he actually taught about it was don't repress sexuality. Yeah. Explore your sexuality. Because they talk about six energy. There's only one kind of energy. Mm -hmm. it, it has to start down here. Mm -hmm. That's sex energy. If we repress it down there, we're repressing our life energy. Mm -hmm. If we can open up and just relax with our sexuality, you know, however you do that, and different people do it in a lot of different ways, but Osho suggested people have experience with their sexuality, become, be comfortable with it, express it, so then your energy can rise and be transformed. Mm -hmm. Come to the heart. He said, on, love on the lowest level is sex. Love in the heart is compassion. Mm -hmm. So that scared people. For another thing, he was a little brown guy from India. For another thing, he blasted the priests and the politicians. He spoke very powerfully against them. And we were also looking at building a community based on love. Our people, when I, I remember when I first walked into the ashram in India, and what blew me away was here were all of these people in, at that time, it, it, now it's all maroon. It used to be from orange to red to maroon, whatever, you know, a, lot, a, a wider range than what is now. It was an earlier stage in the vibrations that Osho was looking at and forward different than Anyway, you would see this vast range of red and orange and purple. It was moving like, moving like the breeze in a tree, you know? Hmm. There was a, a harmony. Unity? Oh, no, yeah. harmony. Mm, harmony. Harmony. And harmony forms a unity. Hmm. The, 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 the song is made up of different streams that are harmonious. There was that, and people, some people were just moving, some people were holding hands, some people had their arms around each other. Some people were just sitting and being, but it was all inside this space of love. Hmm. Blew me away, just blew me away. Hmm. Well, That scares the shit out of people. Mm -hmm. Real love scares people because we have all these fears built up around it, you know? Yeah. So there's all this repression and people being natural, it's weird, weird, you know, they're gonna, you know, it's funny, there was one story, I'll just tell you a quick story. <laughs> in, in Wild Wild Country, there was a guy named John Silvertooth Stewart, you know? who talked about why the people in the community, that little town were freaked out and opposed to him. He said, because you could hear the sex all night. You know? Oh, yeah. He said, do you know how he could hear the sex all night? He went and he hid and he stood outside windows listening to people having sex. Mm. Now you tell me who's perverse. Right. Him or the people inside having sharing love? Right. But the fear that goes back to the collective, you know, mm -hmm. these good Christian folks, yeah. poor Jesus, you know, poor all of those guys. People used to say, how come, how did all of this stuff happen when Osho was enlightened, Sheila and all this stuff, you know? Right. And what I've told people, sometimes I get in trouble with my own people because of, or some people who think, I'm a little too this or that. I often, one of it is I'm a little crude. Sometimes I'm a lot crude. 
Uh, the metaphor actually is that Osho was trying to build the Taj Mahal out of horseshit. Mm. What he had was us, you know. What he had was the rest of the of the planet. He was this enlightened being with a totally transformed, amazing vision, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, he was trying to build it with all of his people carrying around these egos. Mm-hmm. So he was just doing what he could do. He, he was like the river. You know, the river doesn't say, oh, is this good for the rock or bad for the rock? The river flows, you know. Yeah. He flows. Mm-hmm. So there was lots of fear. Basically, it's based on fear. Uh, anger arises out of fear. Um, I mean, they crucified Christ, right? Why'd they do that? Yeah. Osho's message was of love and acceptance. They killed him. Mm-hmm. Many, many mystics throughout history have been killed or tried to be killed. Mansoor. There were apparently like hundreds of attempts on Buddha's life. Hmm. Gurdjieff, you know who Gurdjieff is? George I, Gurdjieff. I do. Yeah, he was a he was a hell of a guy. Uh, Osho talked about him quite a bit, very positively. He t- he talked. He said it was mecha- Gurdjieff said it, and Osho was said this talking about Gurdjieff that the reaction of the masses of those fearful darknesses is mechanical. It's mechanical, like magnetism or the opposite of magnetism. When you have an energy of freedom vibrating totally and fully, freedom is another good word for it, total freedom. Freedom, not indulgence, but no conditioning, freedom, openness, love, sharing, truth. That threatens the darkness. Mm. That threatens the darkness in a very profound and fundamental way. And even if, even when they don't get anything but the surface level of it, they get, they got to get rid of this guy. Mm. Now, one thing, one qualification I just want to make is that those people Like those people were my parents, you know, they could have been my parents. That mindset, that time, that way of seeing things. And they had a, you know, they were good Christians, but they had a rigid sense of what Christ was teaching, you know. As his teachings got perverted by the institutions that carried them on. So they were living in this game of Christianity. On many, many levels, they were really nice old people, you know, just simple old people. But you scratch the surface of simple old people, and there's often a lot of darkness that they haven't looked at and they haven't explored. And when you have that other vibration starting to happen, and a lot of this can be just seen as vibration, you've got a vibration of freedom happening, this light, this intense light happening. And you have this darkness here trying to hold on to the light and keep it down. That holding on is going to be threatened by the light. It's, all, it's, it's always that simple, no matter how complicated it may, like, may get coming down to this plane of reality. Mm. So, and Osho said, I'll finish with this one on this point. Osho said later, when he was back in India, he said, they were right to be afraid of me. He said, those priests and politicians, they were right to be afraid of him. Because what he wanted, what he was after, was helping people to become free. To become free of their own conditioning, to become free of the conditioning imposed on them. To find their own truth. To find their own way. And that is totally threatening to the society which wants good consumers, good soldiers. Power, control. (laughs) Exactly. 
power will always be threatened by freedom. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you for all of the ways you've summarized and the beautiful, I'm really um, sensing the strong energy that you carry. And I'm, I'm hopeful that those who are listening or watching this can also feel that from you. And uh, I definitely feel that presence of Osho here with us. And if I might add that my understanding of, uh, I was actually raised Catholic. Um, I don't ascribe to any particular faith or religion. Um, to me, it's all one. And there's many paths to everything you were just talking about. However, when it starts to separate, which is what a lot of religions do, um, to maintain their power and control that that really is a problem and my understanding of some of the original teachings of Christ sound quite very much in alignment with what Osho was saying and continues to say would you would you say that that there's some truth to that completely Osho actually talked about Jesus in two different long series that were made into books he talked very lovingly about Jesus uh, and his attempts to bring love yeah. to the planet. Yeah. Can we do something for a minute? Yeah. I do this with people a lot. Okay. And for anybody who hears this at any time, just sit up straight and close your eyes. And just tune into the breath. Just let your awareness come to your breath. Just being aware of the rise and the fall of the breath as it comes and goes. Just being aware of breath as it happens. Notice that we don't really breathe. Breath breathes us. We can try to stop breathing, but our body won't. Breath is life. It insists on being life. We breathe in life. And we breathe out. Osho said, breathing in, we're breathing in energy, life energy. We're breathing in awareness. That's like a train. The breath is a train bringing in life, bringing in awareness, and then going out empty. Just allowing the breath, bringing in the breath, filling ourselves with that light. Just allowing that light to fill us. Breathing in life. And you're just breathing out, letting go. Breathing in life. To let it go is not, not really doing anything. When we let go of the out breath, we don't really have to do an out breath any more than we do an in breath. Breath comes in, and then we just, a moment, we have the breath, and then we just let the breath go. We can breathe in life, and just breathe out in relaxation. Breathing in life, breathing out in relaxation. Being aware of the energy, the energy around beyond the breath. The energy within breath occurs. The energy, the awareness itself with which, with which is surrounded, which is with our essential nature, that awareness. Just awareness, empty, but full of energy. Silent, full of light. The breath, the breath can be our anchor, our bridge to that awareness and our anchor to that awareness. We can always come back to that, just coming back to the breath, coming back to the awareness, allowing the awareness to rest in our heart chakra, in the middle of our chest. Just letting ourselves imagine that we're breathing in and out from that heart. Letting the 
heart open, letting that energetic center enter and open from wherever it is. The heart opening, the body opening, relaxing in this vast awareness that is our home, that is our essence. And this space is always here. The space is always here. That is its nature. We may bring our attention away and come back. Whatever we do with our identifications, our life of fear, however we live. But it's always there for us. It has, not like it's waiting because it doesn't come and it doesn't go. It's always there. It's its nature. It is our home, our essence, our place of rest beyond life and death. you ready? You can open your eyes. Mm. Beautiful. Oh, how what a treat to be guided in a beautiful meditation and all the beautiful energy you bring. Uh, one last thing that I just want to, because you're an attorney and because of what you went through, what are your thoughts on mm, what happened with the immigration that was captured in the film? And where we are today, do you see that there's been much change, much hope for more opening around that? Or what's what, needed for that to... What more specific? What more specifically? Are you talking about, about immigration? Has there been openness in immigration? Or? Well, I mean, that seemed to be what ultimately got Osho was around... Yeah, but that, they, that, they only got Osho because they broke their own laws. Okay which is what they're willing to do when push comes to shove. They twisted and manipulated and sometimes just broke their own laws as a way to get him. So that's the answer. So, that, so that's the answer. Is, and do you see that the U.S. government, that there's any movement toward a positive direction around that? Or is that sort well, of... Well, unfortunately, there's movements, <laughs> there's, movements, there's movements in both directions. Yeah. I mean, he wants to, I mean, Trump wants to legalize torture. Think about it. Trump wants to make torture legal. Some guy who just murdered some people, a military guy, who the mil a Navy SEAL, who the military wanted to throw out because he hurt people, killed people, and not in combat, innocent people. Trump overrode the Department of the Navy and gave him back his commission. Trump, I mean, and Trump, you know, there's a lot of people out there. I mean, you look at the fact, the very fact that the, the biggest thing that's possible that could, could stop the Democrats from winning this time, as bad as Trump is, is, is universal health care, Medicare. People people are so fearful of having what they need, having their little life okay. They don't even want to think about the mm -hmm. people who can't get basic adequate health care. Mm -hmm. Not only around the world, but in this country. The people who they don't, I mean, the middle class people, you know, they have some, somebody was telling me a statistic, it's like, uh, there's like, something amazing, like 500,000 Americans every year go into bankruptcy mm -hmm. because of catastrophic illness. Mm -hmm. Think about it. That's our, that's our culture. That's how we care for one another. Mm -hmm. So in some ways it's gotten better, in some ways it's gotten worse. I mean, you can step back and you look at, often the, the, the heads of organizations are looked at, reflect what's in there. Reagan 
now at the time I didn't like Reagan much. I was a always I've been a, a progressive my whole life. But if you look back on it, Reagan was a statesman compared to Trump. He couldn't Reagan wouldn't be accepted in the Republican Party right now because he was too liberal. Isn't that something? Hmm. What does that tell you? But again, like Osho said, in times of there's in, in times of intensity where there's there's, there's perturbation and then relaxation. There's equilibrium and disequilibrium. Right now, things are vibrating like this. Mm-hmm. Something's got to happen in our society. I mean, just what we haven't even talked about, but global warming, you know? Yeah. As, as an underlying huge problem mm-hmm. where millions of people are going to die. That's happening on a planetary level. And something has to come out of that. We have to come into something else. It doesn't necessarily it doesn't I mean it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be good, you know. Mm. Who knows? But again, I'll leave you with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, existence always bats last. Existence always bats last. Mm. You know, in baseball. Whoever bats last has some chance of winning, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. But in the game, in the endless game of existence, existence always bats last. Mm-hmm. And the light, the physicists now agree with the mystics, you know. Mm-hmm. Energy never disappears, it changes form. Mm-hmm. That vast light that is there, inevitably transforms consciousness. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, existence bats last. It will always be there to move towards the transformation of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Whether that happens in time to save our species, who knows? Yeah. But if you stop, if you even stop and look at it for a minute, you know, it's like the time, the, t- the time in our species has been on the planet from the time we got up off of our knuckles and started standing erect. My, th- my theory about that is that that was so that they could see danger or prey farther away. Mm-hmm. They got that they could do that. It was like the, f- but it was, again, a rose out of fear. Mm-hmm. The mind grew out of fear. So whatever that was, like in terms of the vastness of essentially timeless existence, this is not even a coin, not even a finger snap. Mm-hmm. So if we don't make it as a species, you know, this little this beautiful planet will get rid of us and start over. Good, then not, it's not really a problem, you know, mm-hmm. in the cosmic sense. Mm-hmm. But for each of us, for each of us, there's that endless time, but there's each of us with our moment, you know? Yes. This, our moment on this planet, our moment. Yeah. And it comes down to, it's a funny thing, it's always a funny thing. There's awareness. Osho talked about choiceless awareness. Choiceless awareness. Ultimate awareness is choiceless. Choiceless. There can be no choice. Choice happens in duality. I'm going to do this or that. It's duality. In the vastness of awareness, there's no duality. But as long as we exist on this plane of what uh, Ramesh Balsakar called relative reality, a lower, more dense form of energy, we got to choose. And if we can find a way to support ourselves collectively, to make choices, to to learn to make choices out of love and compassion rather than fear and mm-hmm. greed. You got to choose what your values are. That's something you choose. Mm-hmm. What are my values? Mm-hmm. To me, that's the highest value I can see for this planet is helping people discover themselves and their 
beauty mm -hmm. in our nature. Yes. And too, too few people recognize that their loving nature, their ability to love themselves, feel loved, and then share that love. Yeah, we're yeah. all prisoners of our wounds. Yeah. Like somebody said once, the only thing to do is to love more and start with yourself. Yes. Osho said, take care of yourself first, which some people might quarrel with. But the fact of it is, we have to find a way to heal ourselves before we can heal others. Mm. Now, once we start, then we can heal others while we're healing ourselves. Right. But we have to commit ourselves to our own transformation mm. and then let whatever we can share arise out of that abundance. You know? Yes. What a beautiful message. You've given us so much to be with and think about. And are there any last messages? You've said so much. Anything else you might like to share before we wind down here? Well, I want to thank you for reaching out and for being so loving and inviting in this time. There's so many ways to enter into this thing. Awareness includes relaxation. I've touched on that a little, but it's that, that is. Follow your heart. Once, uh, many years ago, when I was getting ready to blow out of my law firm, there was a guy I met, very cool guy. He was sort of a semi-hippie who had been a CPA in Detroit who lived up on a hill in Hana, in, the, in nature, you know. This little hut made of pie of mangrove stuff. He was sitting in my house one night for one night when I first met him with my girlfriend. A nice dinner and all the wine. I was looking where to go, and I said, Charlie, I've been talking about how lost I was feeling. You know? I said, Charlie, do you have any suggestions? And he sat for a minute and then he said, Yes, follow your heart. That actually led me to Osho. Mm -hmm. Or let Osho to me. Mm. If we can do, if we can just do that, if you forget everything else, if you follow your heart and open your heart, you can't be, you cannot go wrong. Beautiful. Miren, thank you so much for your time today, your beautiful energy, your words of wisdom. I, I believe and hope that it will inspire many who are listening and watching to, you know, consider all the things that we've shared here today. Beautiful. I really appreciate you in this. It's been lovely connecting with you. Oh, I feel the same way. Thank you so much. Can we finish with the namaste? <laughs> namaste. Namaste. Maybe not everybody may know what that means. You want to tell them what it means? Well, I've heard different interpretations, but essentially the light in me sees the lighter honors the light in you. Yeah. And more traditionally, it is the divine which is within me honors the divine which is within you. Lovely. Thank Namaste. you. Namaste. Blessings, everyone. <laughs>